Dunbar, uh, some of you will know I run this thing called the Northern Show Rock and Roll Book Club. Uh, there are some new faces in here, so thank you for coming and thank you for those who've been before. Um, I'd written some kind of introductory notes and then on the way down, uh, we've changed it around a little bit. I've got some things, so I don't know where he's got that idea. <laughs> We've worked before, um, and he wasn't happy then either. Now, um, we're going to start, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, uh, Kevin Cummings. <laughs> so the format tonight, uh, we're going to have a short 10-minute curated presentation that Kevin has done. Then it'll be a kind of interview between me and Kevin and ask a few questions I've written down on a piece of paper. Um, can I just ask, how many people here, or indeed has anybody, got a Morrissey tattoo? Not yet. Not yet? <laughs> All right, good, okay. You're brave. Oh, yeah. In a hidden place. I'm just gauging the kind of level of devotion, because we are going to be talking about devotion today. I wasn't gauging it because I want to, I was minded not to ask loads of questions tonight, because I felt like you'd be annoyed at my inept questioning. And if you are Smiths fans, Morrissey fans, lovers of, lovers of photography and of music, uh, you probably wanted to ask your own questions. So I'm probably going to give more of this over to you than to me. So we'll see how it goes. But first, you were going to tee up and talk about what we're going to see? No, um, this is just an edit from the book, and there's a few pictures in here that aren't from the book. And also, there are, um, when you see the handwritten sheets, they were handwritten by Morrissey to, to they were handwritten by Morrissey to accompany a set of pictures I shot in Japan. Um, and so I just dropped some of those into place on this film. Uh, the intro, the poems by, uh, read by Ben Weeshaw and the music's by Philip Glass. Right. Oh, what can ail the united arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail the united arms, so haggard and so woe begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairest child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too and fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love, and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long, for sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy song. She found me roots of reddish sweet, and honey wild and manna dew, and sure in language strange she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses for. And there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed, ah, oh, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La belle dame sans merci hath thee in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam, with horrid warning gaped wide. And I awoke and found me here, on the cold hillside. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering. Though the sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing.
I think people should applaud. We should applaud louder. <laughs> uh, was it enhanced by the uh, the lights and the sirens? I really liked all the shadows going across. It was quite joy to visualize. I'm pleased you said that because I was worried. I think, oh no, he's going to really have a go. <laughs> um, I should say, Eddie, I'm, I'm very pleased. This is uh, the Waltham Forest Borough of Culture Cultural Hub. Is that right? Does it have a name? One Hub Street. Um, I'm really excited to be using this space primarily because. It's at the bottom of my road. <laughs> and everything I do is predicated on proximity. It's completely the wrong end of London for me. <laughs> um, you're not allowed to do this, but I'm going to make an opening statement, personal statement. When you, if you do ask questions, um, they have to be incisive and question-like, not, when I was X, but I'm going to do this. But I think we all share this, because it's my view. If we close our eyes, sorry Rubens, if we close our eyes, you can do this if you want, and consider Ian Curtis, the Stone Roses, Manic Street Preachers, or indeed Stephen Patrick Morrissey, I suspect that the image that you see when your eyes are closed are images created by Kevin Cummings. Does that sound a ridiculous statement or is that something that you would hold true? Can so I just interrupt slightly here for one minute? My, old, my, my former agent, and you'll know why he was my former agent when I tell you this, said to me that his brother was a huge fan of mine, and he's a massive Oasis fan, and he said, he's coming over, for, he was American, he said, he's coming over from the States, and I'd really appreciate it if you could meet him because he idolises you. And I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. And we went to a pub in Brixton, and I gave up my Friday night for this. And the guy said, the first thing he said to me, I really love that picture you did of Noel and Liam, where he was holding him on a rope. I said, it wasn't one of mine. <laughs> and, he, and he went through about 20 photographs that he thought were the greatest photos in the world. None of them were mine. Um, so don't tell me what you were thinking. <laughs> With that in mind, though, this, um, the Salford Boys Club picture, Kevin. Yeah, we, won't, we won't go there. Um, this book, and it's a fantastic book, I don't know if anyone's got it or actually touched it, but it's, it's beautifully presented. Um, I said the, the Hessian binding does remind me of Steel by Joy Division. We're always going to come back to Joy Division. Uh, the other thing that strikes me, um, occasionally Kevin does these uh, print sales. Um, I've bought from these print sales. They're usually around Christmas time. I hope you're doing one soon. I did, I did, did it in October when people have got a bit more money. The, my point would be, a, a quality print of Morrissey, I think you would sell at about 450 wouldn't you? 450 For a 10 by 8 yeah. yeah. I mean, um, gallery prints are £2,000. So, far. at the lower end, this book contains at least 200 pictures, so by my estimate, your £30 investment is about £100,000 worth of quality work. You could buy two and put, cut one up and put them on your wall, and keep the other one on your shelf. It's a thought. But it is a fantastic book, I love it, um, and we're going to talk about it. Um, the book is, I quote, a celebration of photography and Morrissey. Quel surprise. Um, is that a question? No. Right. We'll get to a question. So, my question, my first question, is how long have you been photographing Morrissey? It, and as a second bit, is he your most enduring subject by virtue of his continued career and presence? Um, I always enjoyed photographing Morrissey. I first photographed him in 83. And what I like about working with Morrissey is he's very collaborative. And a lot of musicians aren't at all. They don't really have much idea of what they want to do in a picture. They don't see that part of their job as that important. And so you'll get some bands who, when you ask them if they've got any ideas for a picture, even if you're not going to use them, you just want an idea of how they see themselves, they'll say, mm, queuing up at a bus stop. Um, and you think, well, right, can we just move on slightly from that? Because this has got to be a picture people want to put on their bedroom walls and take out the NME or whatever. 
Um, so some bands understand iconography and some don't. And Morrissey does, as you can tell by the fact that he wears t-shirts with pictures of himself on, he wears pictures with the backdrop for the, for the current tour on, and he understands, he understands all that. And I don't think he's actually wearing a t-shirt with a picture of himself on to, I, I, I don't think it's to, I, I mean, it is narcissistic, but I don't think, I think it's with a hint of irony, and I think it's slightly tongue in cheek, but he really <laughs> understands iconography, and he has lots of ideas for pictures, many that don't work, and a lot that do, but you can also su make suggestions and bring him round to the idea that you want, you know, I mean, when we did this shoot, for instance, this is in his garden, and he thought it would be a good idea to set fire to some garden refuse to give it an, a sense of um, dry ice and smoke in the background. And then I put the contact sheet for the shoot in, and finally he's engulfed in this, and he was choking for about 10 minutes. <laughs> but, you know, he does suffer for his art a lot. How would you describe your relationship with Morrissey? Um, well, he bought some t-shirts from me for the last tour, and he's not slagged the book off publicly, so I think it's, <laughs> I think it's pretty, you know, I'm, I'm not Johnny Rogan, so I think I'm doing quite well. You know, he, he's not wished me under a bus on the M34 or whatever. Now, the book does span a 10-year period. Yeah, more or less, yeah. From 1983 11, to... 11, actually. 11, yeah. there you go. Pay attention, Mark. Um, and how... Firstly, why now? Why this book now? Um, well, oh, I don't know, really. I mean, why now, indeed, when you think of some of the things he said over last year? Um, in fact, <laughs> since we announced the book was coming out. Um, it's been quite a difficult sell. <laughs> uh, selling well in America though, because obviously they haven't got a clue where England is, or our <laughs> politics, so that's okay. Um, I was asked to do it, and uh, over the past seven years, I've been photographing Morrissey and Smith's fans around the world, and, and their tattoos, and I've been getting more into the idea of the devotion of Morrissey fans. And I think, you know, in a way, to me, it complements everything I've done previously. But I also feel that perhaps those pictures are a bit more interesting at the moment and a bit more telling anyway. And they help to complete the story. Um, most fans of bands will have, even Joy Division fans will just have the Unknown Pleasures logo on. Most fans of bands will have, you know, they'll have the Megadeth wings across their back or something. But um, Morrissey fans go for lyrics and go for single lines and stuff like that. And when I first asked on Twitter, I think it was seven, eight years ago maybe, for people to, if I, if I could photograph their tattoos for something, for projects I wasn't really sure of what I was gonna do with <coughs> at the time. Um, Obviously, it was quite easy for, you know, they trusted me because I'd photographed their hero. So, obviously, they wanted their tattoo photographed by someone who photographed Morrissey. And um, they all, I, I mean, some people just turned up and had the picture taken. But some people wrote quite long emails and sent me really long messages about why they'd had certain lyrics on their body. You know, some uh, because it had got them through a particularly tough time in their life. One woman wrote to me about how her father had abused her, and this song was the song that carried her through that period. And so there was some really strong stuff, and I, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. Um, and I felt obviously, once I'd started shooting it. In the main, I wanted the people to be anonymous, which is why there aren't really many full portraits of people with the stuff on, uh, because I felt it was more interesting to have this almost amorphous mass of fans 
without identifying them too much because I felt that the identity was the link with Morrissey. I want to come back to the fans later on, but the first of all, I think we should tell people how the book is structured uh, because it's in, in my mind, in, in some distinctive parts. So we've talked about it, it spans 10 years or 11 years, uh, but how have, you, how have you structured it? Um, it's chronological, really. Um, and I, there are three essays in the book about my, my um, it's kind of autobiographical, I, you know, and, I, and there is, there's a section on um, why I got into photography and studied photography and then there's a section on portraiture and my influences in portraiture and how I wasn't really very interested in rock music, photography. And there's a section on the difference between shooting things live and getting that atmosphere and how that's not really in your control, whereas portraiture is. Um, and the difference between working with that and working with other kinds of stage work. And then there's a lengthy essay at the end about uh, devotion and the fans and the permanence of that devotion and the fact that you're not just writing his name on your jotter at school and then forgetting about it you're taking that lyric on your body to the grave and that's why I wanted something quite poetic for the book title and I took that line from a Keats poem and then I shot Keats's grave in Rome as the opening shot of the book and the closing shot of the book is a grave in Manchester with there's a light that never goes out on it. So it's got a nice symmetry, I think. I really, I'm, I, I'm really pleased with the book. I actually really love it. And I think Cotspus did a great job with that. I, one of the things that struck I me... I say that, they're here. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that struck me reading it, and it was, I found this curious because I, I, I've got several of your books. And I know that they contain a, a narrative that. Uh, but yeah, you mentioned I, I hadn't realised, I didn't real, uh, know about your background, um, uh, how you started off here. And, and that's one of the things I, I learned in the book. I found the essays very, very interesting. I, I'm not a photographer. Like many people here, we, we have incredible cameras, but I don't have that, that vision. But I found it uh, very exciting to read uh, your thoughts on this. Um, I thought the essays were, were fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to read from them, but there were a couple of things that did stand out. Um, you mentioned, I said, we talk about portraits, your, your approach to, to portraits and what your vision is and your art. And one of the things that struck me in there, left out, was you said Morrissey becomes what people would like him to be. Did I actually say that? Yes. Yeah. I put inverted commas around it, so it's you must question. have done. I wanted to ask you what, can you tell us more about that? What do you mean? Um, I'd like to see the context really. I mean it's like giving me saying, you know, here's your autobiography and you say, did I write that? But, um, tell me what, where is it the book? I didn't write the context down, oh, I've just taken it as a book quote. It something completely different. I will come back to that then, I'll give you time to reflect and we'll move on to the other elements. So the book, the book is... simply on the spot here. Sorry, the book is, I thought I'd done a diligent job here. The book is, so we, there are elements about portrait and the, the, the next element is about shooting live and on stage. Um, and I thought the audience would be interested, because I was, in uh, the three-song rule. Yeah, it's something that's been brought in over the last 15 or 20 years from America. And it's the bane of most photographers' lives, I think, now. Um, anybody who shoots live. When I first started, you could just take, well, I mean, you could take a camera in quite often, as long as you had a professional-looking case, they'd think you were from somewhere reputable and just let you in, and then photo passes started appearing. But you could still always shoot the whole show. And then it was towards, I think, kind of towards the late 80s, early 90s, that they started bringing in this rule that the Americans had implemented, that you could only shoot the first three numbers. And it seemed to me that there wasn't a lot of point to shooting then anymore, not shooting live, because the point of shooting rock and roll is that you get good, sweaty, live shots, I think. 
and you wanted to capture the atmosphere of the show. And, you know, I went to photograph prints in Paris once, and when we got there, we, it was at the Zenit, which is a sort of indoor arena, 10,000 capacity or something. And um, we were told we couldn't stand. When we got there, we were all told we couldn't go to the front. Prince insisted we were at the back of the hall. Well, you know, it's like shooting a football match from across the road from the stadium. It, there's no point. And for the first three numbers, it was in complete purple light, obviously. And purple didn't register on transparency film. So there was absolutely no... And none of us had lenses long enough to do it. It was a waste of time. And generally, you know, I, you know, I was doing lead feature work for the enemy at the time. I was doing cover stories, I was doing stuff like that. So if I ever shot live, it was generally because I wanted to go and see the show. And then after the, th the third number had finished, we were told we couldn't stay in and watch the show either. And we were all taken out. And, you know, but as we were walking out, it was almost like the circus had arrived. All the lights went up on the stage. There were people dancing, there was a roundabout. There was all sorts of stuff going on there, but we weren't allowed to shoot any of it. And I, again, similarly, I went to Rome to see Morrissey rather than to photograph him. Um, about 10 years, less than 10 years ago. And there was a photographer who'd driven from Milan for uh, one of the national newspapers. <clears throat> and she was having an argument, which is a six hour drive. She was having an argument with the tour manager who said to her, you've got 20 seconds of the third number. And, she, and so once there's no respect for what you're trying to do, there's no point in doing it anymore. So I would only ever shoot live if the band, if I was working with a band and I could just shoot all the time. And I prefer shooting from the stage because you can get a sense of the atmosphere of the show. You know what it's like to be in a band. You know, you get in the audience, you're seeing the audience's response. And that's more interesting to me than standing on the floor looking up at an enormous um, stage 12 foot high, you know. So, unless you can shoot and get the encore and do all, I mean, you, need, you, you just need a bit of respect, really. We photographed the Stones once for the enemy again, and we were told, there were so many photographers, it was the first night of the tour at Final Stadium in Rotterdam, and we were told we could have two numbers each, so they were going to be photographed for six songs, because there were so many photographers. And you had to either be stage right or stage left. You couldn't be in the center. And we were told at least for half a minute of one song, Mick and Keith would come over and perform in front of you. <laughs> well, what's the point? You know, you might as well just go home. And the audience, who are paying a ludicrous amount of money for this, are just watching something ridiculously over-choreographed now. And clearly, as say, an icon, iconographer, managers and artists are, are losing out, aren't they? Uh, because well, you I can't think so. do I, th I, th I think it's very difficult now, and I think the other problem you've got is the bands... I mean, there's not a lot of money. Record companies always claim there's no money in anything anymore. So bands are taking their own photo. Everyone's taking photographs anyway. Bands are taking their own photographs, and they're taking pictures in areas that we used to think were sacrosanct, like going in the dressing room before a gig or something like that. And now bands are routinely photographing every second of their life and putting it on social media. And they're destroying the idea of iconography because everything is over-familiar. You know, it's, it's very difficult now. You could never do an enemy cover. Well, you couldn't anyway, because it doesn't exist. But you could never do a magazine cover of the style, I think, that probably ran until 2000, 2002, because people are giving too much information. And I think less information makes it more interesting. You know, I didn't want to know what David Bowie had for breakfast. I wanted to think 
that he arrived at a gig in a spaceship. You know, I don't want to know, I don't want to know that they lead ordinary lives and like their own farts backstage. That isn't interesting to me. I, I want to make them into something, give them some kind of, the star quality they've got and to bring that out of them. And that's, that was always our job, I felt. I know you have strong views on that. We've, we've spoken about them before. Uh, and I think they are into that in, in the book. You say, um, one of, partly the affinity you have with Morrissey is based on, you A, like the music from the off, uh, but you said you perhaps got on with him because he had a shared background. Um, obviously both from, for simplicity we'll say Manchester. We can say Irish immigrants. Yeah, and Catholicism. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you had deep theological debates with him, but it's there. Mm. Um, but with these things, there's a professional relationship, isn't it? But uh, in the book you talk about the time in Tokyo, and that seemed to me a time where you're both off in a way. You're not <coughs> working in the studio trying to get some of that, you're just out there experiencing the thing for you, what it's like to be Morrison. Uh, yeah, I was given because I, I was shooting for a tour uh, for the tour brochure as well, so I was getting good access. I mean, we just we would put Morrissey on the cover of the Enemy for anything at all, and at the time there was quite a lot of money sloshing around. And if I just wanted to go to Japan for a week and see the gigs, and Morrissey didn't need to do an interview because. He'd done plenty of them for us over the previous 18 months. And so we said, I said to him, how about if you handwrite the captions for the pictures and we do it like a repertoire on the road piece? And he said, great. And I thought I'd just get a, you know, I, he got contact sheets. I marked up the stuff that I liked. And then he picked the ones he liked from that. And I thought I'd get a typed list of captions to go with them. But as you can see, you know, in true Morrissey style, we had to go and pick this package up from Paddington Station. And there were about 14 or 15 sheets of A4, all written in different colour crayons, <laughs> with all these captions on. So it was a gift for us. I mean, it looked great. Now, I don't think they laid the piece out particularly well. I think if we'd been a magazine, it would have looked better. But it was still, there was brilliant stuff there. And... Um, I mean, I, I turned up at Tokyo uh, on my own and there was nobody to meet me and when I got to the hotel, uh, nobody met me either and I was given a rooming list because they assumed I was, with, I was part of the band and I'm looking through the rooming list and it's all Carry On characters or Coronation Street <laughs> characters um, but I assumed that Eddie Riff because he had a sweet, was maybe Morrissey, and Jasper, or maybe he was Jasper C. Debussy. I could never work out which, which was his room. Um, but, you know, Percy Sugden was there, and Charles Hawtrey, and all the old favourites. And I was glad to see my name actually was on the bottom, untouched, you know, so I did actually have a room. And I'd been there for two days, and nobody, I haven't seen anybody at all. And um, I, got, I thought I'd go out and take some background shots of Tokyo just in case we were going to use something like that in the piece. And the lift stopped in, on the floor below and Morrissey got in and he said, oh, are we going to do some photographs? And off we went. And in Tokyo, they give the, you're always told to go out with a business card with a hotel name on and it's in Japanese on one side and English on the other so that you can give it a cab driver and you will know where you're going back to. And of course, you know, we, for Morrissey wanted to go to Virgin Records, not that he wanted to be spotted or anything, but, you know, he bought himself a couple of T-Rex CDs and then there were loads of people in there and suddenly he was signing autographs and it all got a bit too much and he wanted to leave. And we dived in a cab and neither of us had the card because we weren't, think, I mean, I wasn't thinking I was going to photograph him that day. And um, this girl knocked on the window and she said, do you want to know where you're staying, Mr. Morrissey? <laughs> and she got in the cab and took us back to the hotel. <laughs> the, going back to the first part of the book, and you say, as a, when you started being a photographer, it was portraits that you wanted to do. And there were, you, your influences were people like names I recognise. Um, and in the book, I mean, again, 
We spent a long time in studios doing, doing Morrissey. And what he's brought stuff to, you've already told us that, he's collaborative, he comes with his ideas. Um, have, what did you bring to that? How do you bring this out? This How do you create this iconic figure? I get the sense with Morrissey, I'm, I'm, the contrast with Ian Curtis is the strong one. It seems to me that you made Ian Curtis the, the figure we all, we all see. Um, his influence on that was minor other than just being Ian Curtis, but Morrissey brings a whole more, a lot more knowledge to it and awareness to it. Is that, is that right or? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think with, uh, with Ian Curtis, uh, they were very young and they didn't really have an idea of how they wanted to look. And also, they didn't have much experience, you know, they had, weren't, they'd not, hardly been out of the country. Um, and with Morrissey, he's a lot more aware, he's more aware of how the music press work. He's always been obsessed with the music press anyway. Um, and so, he has ideas that will work, and like I said earlier, he understands the iconography and the narcissism and that side of it. And, you know, it's like when we were doing pictures in what looks like a studio, but it's actually a dressing room in Yokohama. There's Morrissey, he does like lying on the floor a lot, I have to say, that's kind of part of his thing. Bernard Sumner lies on the floor a lot, but he just goes because to sleep. Drunk. No, he just goes to sleep, Bernard. <laughs> got pictures of him on airport floors all over the world, which I'm still trying to sell as a book. Um, but Mor Morrissey, you know, he, 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 he took, there was a promotion, um, I think it was Toshiba EMI in Tokyo, did a promotional jigsaw that was about 12 pieces of a single sleeve. And Morrissey lay on the floor and started pretending he was doing a jigsaw puzzle of himself. You know, and so he understands how that's playful and that is how he can be. Um, and my job is to um, compose it and make it work and make it not look like a snapshot. And also to draw his attention through the camera. Um, you know, a great portrait doesn't stop at the front of the lens. A great portrait goes on to the film, which is two inches, three inches further back. And so a lot of portraits that you see stop at the lens. That's where people tend to look. And you've got to encourage people to look at you and break down the barrier of the camera. The camera ha almost has to be forgotten when you're taking a portrait. And he's got to look at me. And a lot of Morrissey fans have told me that these photographs you know, the, the main edits of the book, really, are pictures that they really like. Obviously, it's a great period of his as well. But they like them because they say, he's looking at me. I look at those pictures, he's looking at me. And it's because he's looking at me, he's not looking at the front of the lens. And that's really important with a portrait. And when you look at great portrait photographers, um, from different periods, people like August Sander and Diane Arbus, the pictures are them relating to the person, not the camera. Is that something somebody can, not the photographer, the subject can learn? Is that something Morris has developed, or is that you that's brought? No, that's out? that's me, and I think sometimes, you know, you without it sounding trite, you've got to kind of, you've got to build a very quick relationship with people sometimes. And you've almost got to, you've got to flirt with them or get them to fall in love with you for 10 minutes and do something like that. And that is really important. That's how it works. And I photographed quite a lot of actors for the Royal Exchange in Manchester for the National Theatre here. You've been, you've been tweeting those pictures recently. I did you? put some up, yeah. I was going through them looking for a certain shot that I needed. And while I was doing it, I put some on Twitter. Um, and it was, it, it's kind of quite interesting and it's, it's also quite hard work because when I started I was cripplingly shy. I, I, I couldn't talk to anybody when I was photographing people. I didn't know how to relate to them or what to do. 
And I think partly because of that, I bring, I would let people do what they wanted in front of the camera. And then gradually I realized I had to control that situation a little bit as well. But I don't, I'm not, you know, I've, I've worked with other photographers on different press junkets and stuff. And sometimes, I mean, everybody works differently, but I'm not the sort of person who tells them a joke or invites myself around for dinner or asks for their phone number halfway through it. Or I want to just get a picture, and that's the most important thing. And I think sometimes if you stand in front of somebody with a camera and you don't say anything, you don't move, they feel they've got to do the work. And that's quite important, getting the subject to do the work. I'm going to give you another quote from the book, but I've, I've presented it's made context. these quotes from the book up. <laughs> I haven't, honestly. Uh, I'm going to read this one in its entirety, but we'll focus in on one thing. And you say, um, you said, revisiting my archive and looking through old frames for this book has been deeply reward rewarding. Uh, not only can I see how the significance of the portrait of hist as historical documents has changed, Actually, I want to focus on that. So I wanted to know a little bit more. I can see how the significance of the portrait as historical documents has changed. Again, what did you mean by that? I think you need to read Roland Bart. You sound like Tony Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Spent too long with him. Um, I mean, what I, my interpretation is these are you know, in a, in a box, in a file, you, you haven't looked at them for yeah, 10, I, 15 I, years. All right, go on. I think that, I think that sometimes with a, with a picture, it develops its own meaning years later. It's like pictures of Joy Division. Um, you know, the picture of Joy Division in the snow on the bridge as tiny figures in that frame. Um, maybe when I took that, it wasn't a regular rock and roll image. Rock and roll photography was more confrontational. And that picture was almost like an architectural shot with the band. It could have not even had the band in it, and it would have weirdly had a similar meaning. And I think that you look at that picture and you know what that band are going to sound like. And I think it sort of builds its own momentum over the years until it almost becomes an icon. It becomes something that you think of when you think of that band. And I think sometimes when you look at a picture that maybe we published at the time, what we would do, we would pick maybe six or seven frames fairly quickly from a shoot, print those and file the next away and hardly ever go back to them. When you're doing a book, you're obviously looking at everything and looking at end frames and looking at bits and pieces that are shot on the end of another roll or, you know, stuff like that. And there are pictures that have more resonance with time. And I think that's what that's about, really. I think sometimes a picture can have a meaning in 1988 that it will it will take it to a different place 20 years later. It's like the picture you may have noticed, a picture of Morrissey with a badge of the British Isles holding it out to the camera. I took that in Ireland, provocatively enough, um, in 1990 in Dublin. And it didn't really mean anything then. It was just Morrissey being playful. I said, you're a bit brave wearing that in Ireland. And he just laughed. Um, but now, if we'd have put that picture on the cover of the book, it would have given the book a whole different meaning. And it wouldn't have had this kind of poetic look. It would have been a very confrontational shot, and people would have expected a different kind of picture in there. I realise I'm not going to read any more of those quotes because I've taken them out of context. I realise I'm doing you an injustice and not doing the audience very many favours. What I would say is each of the essays, um, I think, are, are an excellent um, explanation of your philosophy. And I'm going to call it a philosophy because I think it is. It's a philosophy because I, I, I think you're an artist. Uh, you know, the fact that your, your stuff is in galleries is... is um, uh, it's just art. I'm going to stop there. Uh, but we will... I did say we'd return to fans. Now, 
Uh, one question. I, I'm not the biggest Morrissey fan or Smith, so I, I must admit, these days. I, I've seen him only once. Uh, and to my friends who haven't seen the Smiths, uh, it really annoys them that I did. Um, in my head, Morrissey has a particular adulation in, in places like um, in uh, West Coast America and with the, Me the Mexican community there. You photograph Japan. Is it, is it universal or are there pockets where there's this fascination? Uh, it's pretty universal, really. He's got a huge um, Latino following in South California. And I went there three years ago to photograph quite a few fans who all had gang, well, you can see them, who they had gangland style tattoos, but with Morrissey lyrics on. Um, and, you know, it was, it was great. I mean, he's never going to convert them, for instance. You know, he's, when, when he plays Me is Murder and he puts his abattoir film on, they all turn the back on it, you know. It's not, then they just think, oh, well, he's English, you know. That's what, he, that's what they do over there. But they like him because he, um, he taps into that thing that Mexican singers do, which is singing about themselves and about love and loss and being quite forlorn. And um, the song is a story, really, storytelling. And that's what they love about Morrissey. They think he's the closest thing to um, a Mexican singer who sings in English. When did you first start noticing this as a, as a thing? Um, what, Morrissey having fans? Fans that were <laughs> going to go to that, that next step? Because for me, I, I haven't got no pleasures on my, on my armor, but yeah. Um, um, it's a different relationship. I think you say in the book. Uh, you know, well, I noticed it at gigs, really. I, I noticed it creeping in at gigs maybe nine years ago. You see more people with different things. And then a couple of people told me that they'd got him to sign their arm and then had it tattooed, had his signature tattooed. And then there's one guy in here who actually is quoted in the book. He... Um, he, he got a job at the airport in L.A. so that he could meet Morrissey. Got Morrissey to sign his arm, had it tattooed, and then showed me a photo on his phone of him meeting Morrissey when Morrissey signed his arm. And so there's a picture of the signature and the meeting. He's holding his iPhone out to the camera. And that's kind of what, it's, what it was like, you know. Now, I did say, I, we'd throw open to the audience and perhaps see if there were more questions. So I'm going I'm to stop my questions. We will ask if the audience have any. Um, this is always that tricky bit where everyone's really shy. And as you know, I know some of you, so I will pick on people. But hands up, does anybody have a question for Kevin? I told you no one would ask a question. He will warm them oh, up. Oh, ask you questions at the bar and stuff like that. I don't, I, yeah. And you're welcome to do that afterwards. But um, unfortunately... Think this will reach? Would you be able to stand up and shout? Tell us who you are. Hi, hey, yeah, I'm Daniel. Um, massive fan of your work. Um, you inspired us to, to be music photographer. I do that. Um, I'm a graphic designer by trade and, and do photography because, as you mentioned earlier, obviously, you know, the enemy is not there anymore, and to, to really make a career out of music photography is very, very difficult. Um, my question is probably more about Mary's modern day Morrissey. The images in the book span an 11-year period, as you said. Um, and I'm just curious, have you shot him more recently from, from that? And if so, has he, how has he sort of changed sort of through the years? He's got older. <laughs> <laughs> um, I photographed him in Florence about five years ago, but I didn't feel it fitted in with the book. Yeah. There would have been no point in just putting some random pictures in there. And so I, I wanted it to be a self-contained period. Yeah. And I felt that the first Smith stuff I did, going through to a few pictures of him being hugged by fans, kind of told the story I wanted to tell. So I don't... I think it's very difficult to... Because to, it's got... It had to be my book and my story as well, I felt. <laughs> 
And I didn't think it would have done that if I'd spread it over too wide a period. Yeah. More questions? Oh, one at the back. Can you shout? No, it goes round in circles. He falls out with everybody. <laughs> and then he gets back to you and he's got no choice but to use you again. Um, I don't think I ever fell out with him, which is quite good. Um, but no, he kind of just does what he wants, really. Uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You normally their preferred photography if you don't charge them anything. <laughs> Um, well, there are bands who, whose careers I've covered fairly extensively. I mean, New Order I still shoot, and I shot Joy Division, so I've worked with them quite a long time. Um, but I, yeah, favourite photographers tend to get the job if they don't want to earn any money. <laughs> Did you know Stephen? Did you know Stephen before the Smiths? Yeah, I used to go to gigs. There was like a nucleus of about 50 people in Manchester who used to go to all the gigs. You know, any anything like from, I won't say from the Enid and Van de Graaff generator onwards, but we, you know, you'd see the same faces at the same kind of things, so... I like you. He was in... He was in bands, wasn't he? I mean, you played briefly with... I saw him do his first gig, yeah, when he played with Billy Duffy as a kind of hybrid um, early member of the cult. And, uh, no. Um, do you remind him of this? Is this a line um, you feed him? I can, I've mentioned it. He's really lucky, actually, that I didn't photograph it. Um, he was throwing sweets to the audience, and um, they were opening for magazine. Um, and normally I'd photograph the support band, but I felt that, uh, just to have a few frames on file, but I felt that it was perhaps um, not necessarily that serious and I couldn't afford to waste too much film. Uh, were you therefore as surprised as seemingly everybody else when this creature appeared, Morrissey of the Smiths in 1983? No, not at all. I felt that that's what he wanted to do for a long time and he was determined that's what he was going, that's what was going to happen. And it was a good period to do it. There was loads of, you know, it was easy to form a band and it was easy to get gigs. And when the Smiths came along, um, it was slightly out of time because we'd had uh, a new romantic breaking, th new romantics breaking through and pop becoming a bit more, um, Whimsical, maybe, and so that's me being polite about fucking Duran Duran. <laughs> um, um, and I think that um, I think the Smiths and the Mary Chain came along at the right time and sort of rescued music from what was about to happen. I mean, I think it's no coincidence that bands like Blue Rondo, a la Turk, and all the and you know what was that other lot called? Joe Boxers and all these bands. They're all Cockneys. Yeah, well, exactly. There you go. Sorry, Cockneys. <laughs> and, and all, but all these bands came along who didn't really offer very much. They were pop bands, fair enough, but they came along at the right time because Smash Hits and The Face had just started and colour printing was cheaper than it used to be and they wanted bands to look colourful. And the bands I was photographing all wore grey overcoats and the bands they wanted, they wanted them to wear, you know, cerise trousers and pink and lemon shirts. So that kind of is, that really, the face and smash hits really helped all these bands who, we, we, I was living in Manchester and we're thinking, what is going on in London? It's ridiculous. <laughs> Any more questions? Ah, Mark. Where'd you live now? No. Where'd you live You're giving now? me a left hand. <laughs> <laughs> Tutu. You can tell by the accent, Sorry. can't you? I mean, it's about the north and the south, isn't it? The north versus the south. Yeah, I think so. so a lot why'd, of, why'd a lot... you live in Tutu then? Why? Yeah. Um, 
Uh, it's a really long, complicated answer. Um, but also, I really, I, when I moved, Tootin and Mitchum had quite a good reputation in non-league circles. And I moved a mile from the ground so I could go and watch them. I heard you're a big City fan though. I am, but, you know, non-league, I City play quite often on Sunday because we're on telly a lot. So non-league football's mainly on Saturday, so... Here said so you refused once to fly United Airlines? No, that was a kind of urban <laughs> myth. <laughs> yeah, I once, I, it's, it, it was a very bad taste joke, but I was, I once was supposed to go and photograph some band, it, like someone, not Ned's Atomic Dustbin, not, not someone as good as that, Someone like, someone smaller than Ned's Atomic Dustbin, and we were supposed to go to San Francisco to do it. And the record company had no money, and they, uh, the only way they could get us there cheaply was by changing in Chicago, changing in Texas, and going up to San Francisco, having one night stay, and coming back. And I just said, I'm not doing that for what would amount to a page in the paper. I wasn't on staff, I was freelance. I'd, at the time, I'd probably earned 25 quid for doing that. And I felt I could do something more interesting by staying in London. And I just, I looked at it and I saw the schedule and I just said, anyway, I'm not flying on United Airlines. <laughs> and it's become something that every single person in the music industry knew about me. It was like, and I just thought it was like a joke, you know, and I even did fly United Airlines quite a lot. And we used to share a floor at the enemy with um, a football magazine called 90 Minutes. And one day my subs room, the subs room at the enemy did a thing, they had a thing on the inside back page which was called My Sad Mate. And it was a f football fan and the lens he would go to to go and watch his team. <laughs> And so I had all these ridiculous things about me in there. And then at the weekend when I went up to Manchester to watch City, this bloke came up to me in the pub and he said, I've just seen you in that magazine, mate. He said, fucking hell, fair play to you. Didn't even know those bastards had their own airline. <laughs> It, but yeah, it's because it, it, you know I, yeah, I'd like to think I'm known for taking a picture of Joy Division, but most people know me for doing something that I wouldn't do. <laughs> Just a quick question: Are you from North or South Manchester? Ah, uh, well, Manchester. I was born in South Manchester, so I live in South London. <laughs> I think a couple more questions. Um, oh, quick on. Hello. Hi, a Shout one word out. answer, please, Kevin. Morrissey or Mark? What was what? One word answer, please. Morrissey or Mark? Depends what you're doing with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think it's an interesting question, actually, because obviously we're focusing on Morrissey, but the first part of the book is the Smiths pictures. What was, what was Johnny Marr like? I mean, was he directing you in the same way as... as Not at all, no. The first time... The, in fact, the first, that session... Um, I just say to a band, right, stand how you like, and then I start to move them into a position that I want. And normally with a, a young band, you ask them to stand in, get in position, and they get in the position they would stand on stage. So the drummer sort of slinks off in the background a bit, and you've got the two guitarists and then the singer in the middle, and so then I've got to reposition them and work out what they can do. And I had to photograph this band once for the record company, and halfway through the session, we were doing these pictures in Hyde Park, and the singer came over to me in the middle of it, and he said, can you make sure you get the bass player on the end of the shots, because we're sacking him at the end of the tour, <laughs> and we want to carry on using the pictures. <laughs> so, uh, Morrissey and Moore always stayed quite closely together. Can we never an opportunity to Can we throw that. the question back to you? I mean, Morrissey or Moore? Dead sorry, Moore. Sorry. Is that a recent thing? Is this because of Stephen Patrick Morrissey's unfortunate statements in the last year, or was it always that? No, I'm a guitar and vocals. Okay. So, yeah. so. Um, Morrissey, I prefer lead singers, definitely. Um, I, 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 I would always prefer to photo. I mean, I, you know, I prefer to photograph the two of them together again, given the opportunity. But that is never going to happen. Um, but. 
I, I think Morrissey, because I think Morrissey is much more aware of what he's, well, I'm not sure he's aware of what he's doing at the moment, but I would say <laughs> he's more aware in front of the camera. Richard, did you have a question? Yeah. Let me give you the mic, because so I can reach you. There you go. Hi, Kevin. Um, I thought it was really interesting what you're saying about um, bands today and not having mystique, and the fact that they're Instagramming every single moment of their lives. I think that, coupled with the demise of print publications like the NME and the like mass proliferation of images, Instagram, etc., social media, do you think that music photography still has the potential to be iconic and for photographers today to create the kind of images that you yourself have created in, the, in your career? I think that's quite difficult. I think... Um I think the potential's there. It's whether people understand it. Um, you know, I saw, and um, I'm, I, I always preface this with no disrespect, but the way footballers do, which means I'm about to disrespect someone massively. Um, but I just always remember seeing a picture in the NME a couple of years after I stopped working there of the Strokes and it was of uh, Winnebago, and they were kind of there somewhere. And it looked like it had been shot from two roads away, like it had been snapped without them knowing. Yet it was a picture by someone who was on tour with them, who seemed afraid of going anywhere near them. And I didn't think it told a story at all. And I thought, when I saw that, I thought, rock and roll photography, this picture has killed it because I didn't understand the point of it. I didn't understand what anyone was trying to do with it. And I also think that you're quite often commissioned, not by art editors, you're, you're quite often commissioned by writers. And writers you know, are very literal, very literal in their approach to things a lot of the time. And whenever we were, we were told to, whenever a writer would give us an idea for a story, it was like, uh, okay, uh, we want to do a Glastonbury story, so they've got to hold a sign up with Glastonbury on it. And you think, well, no, they don't, because you can actually interpret this in a picture. And, you can, and every time a writer got involved in telling us what they wanted on the cover, like our features editor at the NMA, it would always be someone holding a sign with a word on it. You know, and it was like when we did the wonder stuff, size of a cow, he said, it'd be a great idea if we do a cow on the cover. <laughs> no, it won't. It will not actually be a great idea. And it's, I think sometimes you've just got to let it up to the photographer to, to, um, to, you know, use their skills and use their art and define something in their own way. Um, and I can't, I mean, you know, I hate to be, I'm, it's like footballers who say, oh, football was miles better 10 years ago when I was playing. But rock and roll photography doesn't seem to have a life at the moment because there isn't an outlet for it. When you had the immediacy of loads of weekly newspapers and magazines and then a, a, you know, a kind of monthly that would have some kind of lofty overview. It was great, but there isn't that outlet for it now. Um, you don't even need album artwork that much. Bands don't need publicity shots because people just nick them from somewhere else. And I'm not sure if, as an art form, it exists at the moment. I think it might do in some countries, but I think it's really struggling in England. It's a shame to end on such a sombre note. Well, we can be really uplifting. We can, <laughs> shall we sing? Yeah. Morris is, no, <laughs> shall, we, shall we ask me something like that? Well, you know. all right. I, I don't know if you remember this. I was told uh, at Louder Than War uh, Words conference oh, yeah. the other day, you told a very funny joke about the fall of Marky Smith. Did. Can you tell that? Well, it's not a joke. All right, a tale. Um, yeah, somebody said, um, 
have you, uh, have you got any stories about Marky e. Smith? And I said, I could probably write a whole book about Marky e. Smith. Um, and just the way he kind of went along in his own idiosyncratic way. But I once, only a few years ago, I went to photograph him in Salford for Universal Rec. I think it was Sanctuary, actually, rather than Universal. And I was told he would be at his rehearsal room. And I got to the rehearsal room, and predictably it was locked up. So I thought, I'll just go to the nearest pub and see if they're in there. And of course, they were all in there in one room. It was in this arse end of Salford. It was a really, really terrible pub. And it was the kind of pub where they didn't realise that the licensing laws had changed and that you could actually drink all afternoon now. <laughs> they thought they still had to close between 10 past three and half past five. And so it was like a lock-in, all the curtains were closed. <laughs> and the, the band were in there. And in the other room, in the kind of vault bit of the room, were <clears throat> probably about 20 of Salford's finest villains and drug dealers. Um, and I, start, I just got my cameras out and I was taking a picture of Mark drinking a pint to add to pictures I've got of him all over the country <laughs> drinking a pint. And um, this guy was looking across the bar at us and he was a real villain and he had loads of prison tattoos and stuff. And he came over and he said, why is he taking your picture? And Mark said, Maybe he likes me. <laughs> and the bloke looked around and he could see there were guitars and bits and pieces there. And he said, are you in a band? Uh, Mark said, we might be, why? And he said, would I have heard of you? And he said, how the fuck do I know who you've heard of? <laughs> And I'm thinking, this is absolutely going to kick off here. <laughs> and he said, try me. And Mark said, the fucking Beatles. <laughs> and they just looked at each other for about what seemed like about 10 minutes, but was probably about 10 seconds. So they were just staring at each other. And he looked at him and he obviously thought Mark was madder than him. <laughs> and he just said, Good name, mate. <laughs> and went back in the other room. <laughs> Kevin Cummings, everybody. Uh, there are, I'm afraid, a very limited quantity of this fantastic book back there, which Waterstones will be delighted to sell you, and uh, which Kevin will be delighted to sign, I'm sure. I've also got in my bag, because he asked me if I'd bring them, I've got um, a, a couple of sets of Smiths and Morrissey postcards, and a couple of New Order ones, and a couple <coughs> of punk ones. Um, Excellent. Nice Christmas presents. Indeed. Them. They're 25 quid a box, oh. and they're dead nice. I've asked this before, I'm going to ask you again, and um, you can say no. Would you do us the honour oh, of oh, taking yeah. a photograph of our audience, so we can simply say, we've been photographed by Kevin Cummings? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, five or each. <laughs> My, my camera or yours? Oh, yours. You can have that. There you go. There you go. Then you own the copyright. Do I? Is that how it works? <laughs> if you want to stand on the bench. Anyway, your best moody iconography. Does your phone even work? Maybe not. Has anyone got a phone? I've got it online. Does anyone follow Kevin's Instagram? Um, whenever you post something, it's usually a train station crew or yeah. Leon. Um, I, I'm, I'm truly astonished. I think, how does he do this? I'm going to do a book of train stations. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, also, um, I would like to say a big thank you to Disco 2000, who are going to be playing some music. Kevin, I think, is going to hang around whilst I play him with... Uh, with white wine and sign those books. Um, I'm sure he'll ask, answer your questions. Uh, thanks for coming. We have one next week, uh, Will Ashen on the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, I can see you're all really enthusiastic about that. I'll just tell that. you one, one more thing about book signings before you go. Um, normally people won't ask a question, but then when they're getting a book signed, they're asking you loads of things. And a few years ago, Bobby Robson, who was the England manager, 
was doing a book signing in Manchester. And this lad came up to him and he said, oh, I bet you've signed loads of those, haven't you, mate? And he said, yeah, I've signed hundreds, lad, hundreds. And when he got his book back, he signed it, Bobby, hundreds. And I'm always, always aware of this when I'm doing a book signing, because I always think I'm going to write down what you say. And it's, it just, it's ever, ever since I saw this, it's terrified me. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.